All right. Hello, if we have not had the opportunity to personally meet, my name is TJ. And about four years ago, uh, right before the pan pandemic, uh, August 18th, I believe it was uh, 2019, uh, I had a contract job. I moved from uh, Oklahoma just to do a contract job for a couple months and then go back. But my first Sunday in Pinellas County, I came to Generation Church. And I remember walking in, I immediately felt the presence of God here. And during worship, I just remember weeping before the Lord. And then during the message, it felt like it just really resonated with me, like no one else was in the room. And I left that Sunday thinking, this is horrible. I don't even live in Florida, and this is my home church. <laughs> so three months later, I bought a house here with my wife. We moved our kids down, our three cats, our dog, and we made Seminole, Florida our home. And if you don't know Meg Ammons, that's my wife over there. She's one of the worship leaders here at our church. Um, but I grew up, I was a pastor's kid, uh, thought I'd never be a pastor, and then I found myself in seminary getting my master's in Christian counseling and my doctor in theology. So never say never. I think that's a Justin Bieber song or something. I don't know. But today I wanted to talk to you about destroying the works of the enemy in your life. Who knows that God has called you to destroy the works of the enemy in your life? And I believe that God is ready and willing to make that move, that shift in your life. Amen? So we're going to pray. So, Father God, we just thank you for your presence being already here. We thank you, Father God, that you're a good God, that you're a good Father, that you hold true to your promises. And I thank you, Father God, for anointing us as believers to destroy the works of the enemy in our life. So we just thank you. And we're not gathering here as a social club or just a group of people, but we're here believing and expectant for your Holy Spirit to continue to work on the inside of us to deepen our relationship with you. And so we thank you for these things. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So if you leave today, I just want you to at least know one fact. That God has called you to destroy the works of the enemy in your life. Several years ago, I led an online class. It's called How to Be the Father, the Husband, and the Spiritual Leader of Your Home. And I had a good friend that was a Christian call me. said, I wish you would have had this class last week because this week my wife is signing divorce papers. She's leaving me. And as we continued to talk, he told me about how their uh, disagreements turned into fights, into arguments. And then he began to be become consumed with anger and frustration and that no longer would she take his calls, she would meet up with him and that things were just too late. And so he began to tell me, you know, my wife is a witch and we used to go in a spell book together, we used to read things, we used to go to psychics, we used to get, uh, go to get our tarot cards read, we used to go to get our auras checked, but all of a sudden when these things started happening in our lives, there was just this huge division and anger and frustration. He said, but the worst thing is not only am I getting divorced this week, but every time I go out now, I begin to scream uncontrollably. There's this thing that just takes over my life. I don't know what it is, but it causes me to stay in isolation now. So I'm afraid to leave my house because I'm so embarrassed when this happens. I can't control it. And so I told my friend, I said, hey, I have some good news for you and I have some bad news. I said, the bad news is that you have opened the door in your life for the enemy to step in and start taking control. And these doors that you're opening, now you have a loss of control in that area and the devil is wreaking havoc. Just kind of imagine like an unwanted friend that comes to your house, eats up all your food, sits on your couch, puts his feet on the table and leaves this trash everywhere. That's what the enemy is doing. He's trying to make your spiritual house a mess. And so as we continued our talk, I said, let's hop on a Zoom call, and we're going to pray. Because I said, the good news is that Jesus came to deliver you today. Jesus is going to take control of that area of your life, and he's going to set you free. How many people are happy about Jesus? And so as we continued to call, we began to pray. So I'm looking at him through Zoom, and we're not praying like, God bless this food today. 
So that's not the type of prayers we're praying. We're praying, in the name of Jesus, we command this thing to go and to leave your life right now. And as we continue to pray, one minute into the call, he begins shaking on the screen and he falls out. I can't even see him anymore, but I'm still praying. The Holy Spirit speaking to me. I'm praying whatever I hear. I'm praying scriptures. And two minutes later, he gets up and he looks totally different. It's weird, like, I, you know, people say it all the time, but it's like I almost couldn't recognize him. He was smiling. He had so much joy. And he was, even though he was crying, but he felt so happy, he said, this is the first time in my life that I finally felt free. So why am I sharing this today? Is because even though we know that God has a plan for your life, and that's good, and, you know, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you. We say that scripture, we cite it all the time, but how many of you know that Satan has a plan for your life as well? The Bible says that he goes to and fro seeking to kill, steal, and destroy. And for us in here today, three practical ways that the enemy is challenging your life. It's one, it's to torment and to torture you. Two, from, to keep you from knowing Jesus. And then three, is if you know Jesus and you're a believer, is to keep you from being effective and serving in his kingdom. And one thing I want you to know and recognize about the person in that story is that he was unaware that he had opened the door to the enemy and that he was in bondage. If you asked him, he would have said, oh, yes, I'm a Christian. But sometimes even as Christians, we're supposed to be focused on God, but all of a sudden sometimes we lower our vision from looking up down to looking around and the things of the world get in the way. You know, sometimes we, we confront stress or difficult situations, and Jesus said, hey, you're going to have trouble in this world, but what happens is that when we stay focused on that trouble, on that thing, we let it settle and grow and live rent-free in our minds, and that's where the enemy begins to come in. But I'm sharing this because when Jesus came, he set the captives free. When Jesus came, he empowered his disciples. Disciples. He, encountered, he empowered his disciples to be able to set the captives free. And that was the first authority that's interesting that he gave his disciples. Not necessarily to heal the sick and to do all those other things, but to set people free and destroy the works of the enemy. Again, do you know that you are called to destroy the works of the enemy in your life? And for some of us in here, if we're honest and we're open, fear has been dominating some of your decisions. Anxiety and stress have been weighing physically down. Like you walk around, you can actually physically feel the stress. Maybe your heart is racing. Maybe you have panic attacks. Maybe there's cycles of sin and different things in your life that for three months you're good. Everything is going great, but then all of a sudden... You get back into this cage, and the thing that you don't want to happen happens again. Is anybody else in here with me? And for some people, maybe it's feelings of being unworthy. Like, man, I'll never meet the mark. I'll never be good enough. So I want to give you today, I want you to leave today with three steps or three keys on how you can destroy the work of the enemy in your life. Can we talk about that today? Sometimes these things make people feel a little bit uncomfortable, but it's in the Bible, so we're going to talk about it today. All right? Amen. So the first step is realize that God has given you the ability to be set free. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, 1 John 3, 8b, it says that the Son of God came. He was made manifest to destroy the works of the enemy. You know, sometimes what I've learned in Bible school is that it takes a theologian to complicate things that are so simple. Why did Jesus come to destroy the works of the enemy? Are you a believer? Yes, I'm a believer. So if you're called to be a believer, that means you have the same authority that Jesus did if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. So if he's called to destroy the works of the enemy, then you are called to destroy the works of the enemy. Mark 16 Verse 7, the first thing says, these signs shall follow those that believe. They shall cast out demons. They shall destroy the work of the enemy. And so it was an expectation of early Christians to be able to live free, 
and destroy the works of the enemy in your life. So imagine it's God's expectation is for you to actually be police officers and enforce his will on this earth. It's your job. It's your duty. He expected you to do it. It's the first supernatural gift that he gave the apostles. Can a Christian be oppressed? So what that means is that even as a Christian, there could be an area in your life that you have a loss of control, an area where you don't have victory in yet, or maybe that you just open the door for the enemy to come in. I remember I was the men's pastor here, and about two years ago, uh, two and a half years ago, I was still working for a company called Progressive. I was bivocational, and um, I would answer phones. People would call in about damage to their house based upon storms, different things like that. And so I would take calls, and during the pandemic, we all worked from home. And so I remember my job was to simply take calls. So I got this one call picked up, and this guy cussed me out. I mean, like, he cussed me out so good. After I got off the phone, I'm like, man, I have to respect him. Like, he did the best he could do. I'm, I was just so amazed. I had never been cussed out like that before. But what happened is that fear gripped me. For the next two days, every time that phone rang, my heart began to race. I would experience fear. And I thought to myself, if I answer that phone, somebody's going to hurt me again. And I can't deal with it. So after every call, I would listen to the voicemail, listen, like, okay, it's safe for me to call him back. All right, I'll call him back. Because what happened, because I was dealing with fear. And then day three comes, and I'm sitting on my chair, and the phone rings, and all of a sudden, heart's racing. And then I'm like, well, wait a minute. This is my house. This is ridiculous. Why am I not answering the phone in my own house? This makes no sense. And then the Holy Spirit revealed to me, you're dealing with fear. I said, by the authority of Jesus Christ, I cancel the spirit of fear right now. I command you to go because God did not give me a spirit of fear, but of power and of a sound mind. Amen? Amen. There's some people in here that you need to reclaim your house because the enemy has kind of kicked in the door. He's been coming through the windows and we've been quiet. Take authority in your house. But the first thing is you have to realize that God has given you the ability and he has called you to destroy the works of the enemy in your life. Number two, you have to recognize how the enemy gains access. Because it's so easy to say, hey, the enemy, he's attacking you. Everybody's like, yeah, yeah, I understand. But how? When you understand the how, then you have power. And so what we're going to do, we're going to go through 1 Samuel chapter 18 and going to read verses 5 through 12. And the reason why we're going to read this text is because I want to uncover the operation or the process of the enemy because he has a process that he works through. First step, everybody say stress. So stress, anything that's like overwhelming to you, like an event, a trauma, something that just seems overwhelming, like, oh, man, I can't deal with this. He starts with the stress. Step two is a stronghold. Everybody say stronghold. Biblically speaking, a stronghold is a strong way of thinking. And the Bible gives us a picture of a fortress, four walls. But the problem, what's inside the fortress is a lie, which means the truth can't penetrate it. Have you ever went up to somebody and says, man, hey, brother, Jesus loves you so much. Then they're like, Jesus can't love me. You don't know my story. It's like a spouse saying to the other spouse, man, you're so beautiful. I love you. And they're like, you can't love me. I'm not beautiful. Maybe there's people in here that have been dealing with trauma and cycles in your life since you were a kid. And somebody comes up to you and says, Jesus can set you free. And you're like, I've been dealing with this since I was a kid. Maybe you're saying, I was introduced to pornography at a young age. And I'll always have this. And then you begin to find your identity in the lie because it's a fortress and the lie is inside and the truth can't penetrate. So that's what a stronghold is. So we have a stress. We have a stronghold. And everybody says spiritual domination. Now, this is how the enemy gains access. And so once you have a stronghold in place in your life, a lie that you're believing that you're standing on, it just opens the door to the enemy to now take control over an area of your life. 
And so what this scripture is going to illustrate is going to see, you're going to see how King Saul, how the enemy attacks him and how he falls right into the process of the enemy. Are we ready? So 1 Samuel chapter 18, it's your Bible, your smartphone, your scroll, whatever you got today, we're going to read together. And it's going to be in the King James Version, so if you don't understand any words, that's okay. The Lord will still bless it. All right? Amen. So, and David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So David's having favor. That's great. And it says, and it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women came out of all cities. Everybody say all. All cities of Israel. So it's a lot of people. They're singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy and the instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played. And Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. So I'm going to pause right there to give you a little context. So everybody knows the story about David and Goliath. David fights Goliath. He wins. He rescues Israel. Saul is sending him out on all these different missions, and he's successful. But here's one thing. Saul is the appointed king of Israel. He's actually the first king of Israel. So as the first king, he's really trying to solidify his power, his position. And as the first king, he wants a legacy. He wants his son, Jonathan, to be king. But all of a sudden, David, like God has his hand on him, and Saul is beginning to feel a little bit uncomfortable, jealous, right? And so let me give you context to what this scene looks like. If we have a little music. So everybody's celebrating, right? They're going to turn the music on. Everybody's going to start clapping. I'm going to set the scene. So Saul's coming up. Everybody's cheering. Saul's waving. Thank you, King Saul. Everybody's waving. Saul's kissing babies. All the stuff, the music is going, and then they start singing his song. Saul has killed his thousand. You see Saul just kind of just doing his little dance right there, just cheering. He's like, man, I love this song. This is the best song ever. But then it gets to the second verse. It says, David has killed his ten thousands. And he's like, I don't like that song. Kill them. No, he doesn't say that. But ultimately, he really hates that because what happens is that he's dealing with jealousy in that, in that moment. Now he's becoming overwhelmed because he's thinking like, man, this is a problem. People are loving David. So now there's the stress, right? We talked about that. But now the next part, here goes, it says, and Saul, in verse 8, and Saul was very wroth, and a saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they ascribe but thousands. Jealousy. You know, sometimes jealousy, it's one of those things, those body odors that, you, that other people can smell, but you can't smell on yourself because you're so used to the scent. Mm. It says, now, what can he have more but the kingdom? That's the lie that the fortress is built around. First, he's upset. He's jealous. But then the lie sinks in. Now he's trying to take my kingdom. He's trying to take my legacy. And so he's like, nope, that's not going to happen. So then what happens after that is that after that lie is there, the stronghold is there, remember the strong way of thinking, then the door begins open for the evil spirit to come in, the spiritual domination. Next verse, it says, and Saul, I, David, from that day forward. So just imagine David coming to the palace, hey, Saul, we have another victory. And Saul's like, that's great. Because what happens is he's not really excited about David anymore. He's thinking about how to get rid of David. So he's not celebrating him. He's trying to kill him. Okay, so listen, it says, And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hands as at other times. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast that javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. So one of the other things that are happening in the background, Saul's advisors, when this evil spirit began to plague Saul, they're like, man, we need somebody anointed. We need somebody anointed. So when this person plays, that the spirit would leave. So back then they understood about anointing. 
But sometimes today as Christians, we don't understand what that anointing is. It's God's power on our lives. And listen, it says that Saul was afraid of David. Did you know that the enemy is afraid of the anointing that God has placed on the inside of you? That what God has placed in you is stronger than what the enemy is presenting on the outside. So whenever you're confronted with what the enemy is doing in your life, you say, God, has, God's name is above everything that I'm encountering right now. His power is greater. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Amen. And so what we recognize is that a couple things is that if you're anointed, the enemy is going to fear you. God has placed something powerful in you, and that thing that he placed in you is his call to destroy the works of the enemy in your life. So God has called you to destroy the works of the, the enemy in your life. And I want to go over several ways, additional ways that he gains access into your life. Can, I, can we talk about that? All right. So first thing, now this is not an exhaustive list, but I want to share several things with you. So pressures in early childhood, so listen up. So when we are kids, the enemy knows that our defenses are low to non-existent. And we don't even know that we are in battle and how to fight back. We experience childhood pressures like abuse, fear, and adversity of family situations that all play a role in creating open doors for the enemy to shape what we believe about ourselves. Sometimes moments of weakness are place of weakness. This is when a specific event happens, like a negative thought from the enemy. And we open the door by believing the lie. All of our thoughts come from God, the enemy, or our flesh environment. And if we accept a lie from the enemy or our flesh and dwell on it, that's the key, dwelling on it, we position ourselves to live, believe, and behave based upon a lie, even if the truth is obvious to everyone else. Another way that the enemy gains access in our life, sinful acts or habits. When we continue in habits of sin, here it is, we relinquish control. We give control and allow the enemy to afflict us to where we become enslaved, addicted, and cannot stop. But I came here to tell you that Jesus can set you free in every single area of your life. That Jesus is in control, and if you're a believer, that you're anointed to destroy the works of the enemy in your life. So step one, we have to realize that God has given us the ability to be set free. Two, we have to recognize how the enemy gains access, because we can't keep leaving the doors open in our life, right? Now three, we have to release it to Jesus. This is the most important part. Remember in the first story that I shared? When I got on the Zoom call with the guy and we prayed and we released it to Jesus and he was set free. Remember when I was sitting in my room and I realized how ridiculous it was to not answer my phone when they were paying me to answer the phone? Wasn't that ridiculous? But what happened is I released it to Jesus. And so what we need to do now, there's areas in all of our lives that where we've probably lost control. Maybe things that have been happened to us while we were kids. Maybe there's thoughts, jealousies, anger, addiction, whatever those things are. It may not be something very serious. It may be something even very small. But those things have continued to happen time and time again in our life. Now, it's not the actual prayer that saves us and sets us free. It's the partnership with the Holy Spirit. It's allowing him to work in our lives and just releasing it to Jesus. Because there's things, weights that we endure and we walk with in our life that we weren't created to carry. Can everybody stand with me? So this is what we're doing. We're going to pray because we're all family. I know we're here at the church, and sometimes people feel like a little uncomfortable, and you try to put on a mask and wear your best outfit, come to church, and obviously I didn't do that. So I'm being very informal. But listen. Usually there's several areas where the enemy kind of comes in. One of them is unforgiveness. I know I said the word unforgiveness, and I feel like several people are like, oh, man, he's talking to me. Listen, unforgiveness will wreak havoc in your life. There's a Greek philosopher that said it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Even the Bible says that if you have a gift to give, 
and you have unforgiveness in your heart, leave it at the altar and go make it right with your brother. Mend that relationship and then come back and then present that gift. In our culture, another thing is very prevalent, which is witchcraft, the occult. The new age is so popular. You have to have the right energy. Did you check your horoscope today? What did it say? Oh, these aren't tarot cards. These are angel cards. These are approved. Listen. Satan has a plan for your life. He wants to make the things that don't honor God seem good and comfortable. But God didn't call you to live a comfortable life. The last thing is that there's just habitual sin sometimes in our life. Like we keep coming to the same road and these, these same actions, these same things continue to happen in our life. And it's time that you're set free from those things. We have to realize that we are called to destroy the works of the enemy in our life. He created us to fight. So we're going to pray. We're going to do our part and the Holy Spirit's going to do his part. And so all I'm doing is opening the door for you to posture your heart for the Lord to move in it. So repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you're the Son of God and the only way to God that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. I now confess to you of any sins you have made me conscious. Now just keep your eyes closed, your head bowed. Now listen, this is the time, it's between you and God. Sometimes it feels like we're in a sixth grade dance, everybody's focused on us, but the truth is, everybody is focused on themselves. And listen, the Holy Spirit wants to do something in your life right now, so stop here. This is where we confess those things to him. And as we start, the Holy Spirit will reveal them to you. Listen, if you don't confess them, you get to keep them. So just release it to Jesus right now. Listen, there's a type of sin called iniquity. That means things that have been happening in your family line. Maybe it's like, man, everybody in my family, man, they're all alcoholics. They're all addicts. Maybe you said to say, man, divorce runs in our family. Anger runs in our family. Lust runs in our family. It ran into your family until it ran into the Holy Spirit. And today it's going to be done. It ends with you today. So repeat after me. Say, Lord, I repent of all sins I have ever committed. I hate them. I turn from them. I turn to you, Lord Jesus, for mercy and forgiveness. If I have been involved with the occult, I repent. I renounce it. I sever myself from it. So important. So right now, it's time to confess any occult involvement. It means getting your palms read, visiting a psychic. You remember, oh, I don't do those type of things. Listening, watching movies that glorify witchcraft, killing, rape. That's a doorway for the enemy to come in. Reading horoscopes, Santa Maria, voodoo, placing curses on people, satanic witchcraft, and worship. Freemasonry, college fraternity, secret societies. Listen, rid your life of those things. All those things are trying to stand in the place where God is supposed to stand in your life. Is he only Savior or is he Lord of your life as well? Release those things to him. Repeat after me. Through the blood of Jesus... If I have occult objects in my possession, I commit myself to get rid of them. Now here's a big one. Say, Lord, I forgive any person 
who has ever hurt or wronged me. I forgive them just as you forgive me. Now go ahead, say their name right now. Say their name. Release them from that debt right now. Forgive. Don't let the enemy stay in your heart. I'm seeing people hurt from past relationships. Parents. Man, my mom and dad, they weren't there. Or maybe if they're there, I wish they weren't there because of the damage that I've gone through in my life. Parents, maybe you need to forgive your kids. You've been dealing with anger if they've done something to you. And the way you treat them is not out of forgiveness. It's not out of love. Release them from that right now. Bullies, everybody who's hurt you, release them from it right now. It's not worth it. Release them. Let it go. Let God deal with them. And listen, hurt people, hurt people. Forgive them. Release it. It was just an attack of the enemy. It wasn't even meant for you. Release them right now. Repeat after me. Say, Lord, to the best of my ability, I have met your condition. I now claim your promise. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Say it again. Shall be delivered. One more time. Shall be delivered. I'm calling on you now. In the name of the Lord Jesus, deliver me from the enemy. I hate him. He is not my friend. I command them to go from me now. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to pray over you right now. So Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for your presence here. We thank you, Father God, that wherever Jesus went, the enemy would flee. And so right now, the presence of God is here with us, and we command the enemy to go right now. And your word is said, whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So right now, we bind the work of the enemy right now against every single person and family represented in this place right now. We command that they're loosed right now. We break every single legal contract. We close every single door that has been opened right now. We claim that they're renewed right now by the power of God, by the authority of Jesus Christ. We cancel the work of the enemy. No weapon formed against them shall prosper. In Christ, they are more than conquerors. Do it for them right now, God, and do it again. Make them free right now, free over every addiction. Right now, I curse the root of every disease right now. I curse cancer right now by the authority of Jesus Christ. I curse every demonic stronghold right now and I cast it down right now by the authority of Jesus Christ. Every mental illness with a spiritual root right now, we command it to go and leave from them right now, up and out by the authority of Jesus Christ. You cannot stay, you must go. You must go. The name of Jesus is above every other name. Sickness go, fear go. Anxiety go, stress go, panic attacks go right now by the authority of Jesus Christ. Leave, leave, leave. Jesus, finish the work right now. Purify your sons and daughters right now. Now, Holy Spirit, every place that's been vacated by the enemy, fill feel and overflow in our lives right now all those gifts that have been remaining dormant that have been pressed down let them spring up fresh right now father god all the gifts that you have placed on your sons and daughters let them flow freely right now in the name of jesus i declare provision right now in the name of jesus over the families here i declare peace in their households right now and joy in their households right now by the authority of Jesus Christ. By the authority of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name.